my name is Hugues Maitre. I work with a research lab in, in France called LETI, which is a technology research organization a little bit similar to what you have here uh, run by IBM in Albany or Fraunhofer Institute in Germany. Uh, basically, we are a technology platform that uh, uh, do process research and prototyping on collective manufacturing technologies. Um, the reason why I want to talk today is um, just a, 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 a question. Who recognizes that man in the, in the uh, community here? So one year ago, um, I asked the same question to a conference called uh, 3D TSV Technologies in Dresden, which is a conference for people developing 3D technologies uh, in the semiconductor industry, and nobody uh, raises the, raise the, the, the hand. Um, so I believe that if people in the 3D community don't know about neuromorphic, maybe it might be useful also for the neuromorphic community to hear a little bit, a little bit of what 3D technologies can bring to, uh, to neuromorphic systems. The second anecdote is that um, um, about 12 years ago, we were uh, signing at Leti a cooperation with Caltech, uh, and the president of Caltech uh, made a little celebration in the Einstein Library at the Athenaeum uh, and invited some professors uh, emeritus. And I had the chance and honor to be seated right to uh, cover med, and I didn't know who he was <laughs> uh, because I'm from the 3D, I'm from the semiconductor industry. So please. Don't uh, uh, evaluate me on my knowledge of neuromorphic or, 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 or neural networks. I'm more into technologies. Um, why 3D might be interesting? This is, a, this is a picture I took from Scientific American uh, that shows how um, retina that I believe was developed by University of Pennsylvania at that time uh, is inherently a 2D, uh, uh, a 2D mapping of structures that are inherently 3D in the, in the brain. Uh, uh, and why is it so? It's because the semiconductor industry mainly knows how to do things in a plane by uh, 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 drawing transistors uh, on, on a plane. At Leti, we've done some developments because we not only do uh, semiconductor technologies, but we also have IC design teams. And uh, recently, we've designed um, uh, a chip that tries to do uh, classification of handwritten numbers using very little number of neurons and synapses, uh, uh, building synapses around uh, memory stores technology like it was mentioned yesterday, uh, Oxram technology that we developed at Leti. And what you can see is that uh, when you look at the surface area of the chip, the neurons and the uh, Oxram memories represent maybe less than 15% of the chip because all the area is required by the interconnects and the interfacing and, and, and so on. And so maybe stacking one above the other might, gain, uh, might, might help us gain a lot of uh, surface. Uh, this is an unpublished result yet, so I'm, uh, I'm not commenting too much on the results. Um, a few years back, we started looking at how uh, smart retinas and vision, vision processing could be done using 3D, uh, uh, 3D structures. Uh, so uh, because of the constraint of technology, we couldn't stack four layers of, uh, of uh, different functions. So we decided to do two, two layers interconnected on an uh, interposer. Uh, so you have the silicon retina with uh, the pixels and the preprocessing, and then another chip, which is two levels of a neuro, uh, spiking neural network uh, uh, design. Um, and so we, we implemented using technology that I will present in a few minutes. Uh, we had uh, interesting results in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, processing capability of the retina uh, and the density of in interconnect uh, that we could do between the two uh, layers. Uh, I'm going very quick because the time is limited. Uh, and uh, we also did, sorry, a new neural networks uh, processor. We built two versions of it to be able to, to compare what would be the different characteristics of the 2D versus the 3D uh, circuit. And we showed an average gain of about 20% uh, in terms of uh, critical path, power, uh, area, and wires. 
and so this is a, this is a processor that was designed to to uh, analyze uh, basic stru uh, uh, structures in the images uh, in two layers and it would be of course interested to go to more layers to be able to analyze more complex uh, or differentiate more complex uh, structures so what about 3d technologies uh, what we believe might be very interesting uh, for the neuromorphic co community is to show how higher density interconnex can uh, are, are developed in the industry for other applications. Um, uh, the 3D 3D uh, uh, environment is uh, organized around the granularity scale that you can reach in terms of interconnects between two layers, and uh, there are depending on whether you uh, look at the transistor or the logic gates or logic blocks or anti-cores or anti-circuits, you don't have the same kind of technologies that you can use. Uh, this one is called 3D sequential. At Leti, we call it cool cube. It's a, it's a way to reach very high uh, density and very high pitch, high precision, because you use lithography techniques to align a transistor on top of the other <laughs> because you grow a transistor on top of the other using lithography alignment. And the other is more like 3D packaging because you will take a subfunction, a chip, or a wafer, and stack it on top of the, of the other. Uh, this is driven mainly by the advances in, in uh, com uh, advanced computing. Uh, 2.5D and 3D, for instance, have been implemented by uh, companies like Xilinx, AMD, NVIDIA, uh, that stack uh, memory cubes very close to the uh, FPGAs or to the GPUs to increase the bandwidth between memory and the GPUs. Uh, one of the key technologies that are used is what people call through Silicon VR because you need to uh, create a path between uh, the, two, uh, 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 the, the two faces or your substrate to interconnect the functions. Uh, what we work today on is another technique called hybrid bonding. And the idea here is to uh, suppress the space that appears between two layers when you do a bumping or a pillar uh, by preparing the surface to create paths of copper in between silicon oxide uh, areas that you can uh, uh, bond uh, to each other with a perfect interface with a, uh, a crystal regrowth through a, a thermal process at low temperature. And this is very interesting for different reasons. One is that the, in, the, the, the resistance or the, the, the characteristic of the interconnects at the interface between the two layers is quite perfect. There is no, uh, there is no uh, polymer that you need to interface in between your bumps or copper, so the quality of the bond is, uh, is almost perfect, very good for reliability. And uh, this technique allows to go to a micron pitch or below in terms of precision of alignment, which is far above what can be done with uh, classical uh, 3D techniques. So we believe it might be of interest for neuromorphic because you want to have as many interconnects as possible because the brain is about interconnects. Um, what we do is we can do that at wafer level, stacking wa uh, wafer over the other. It is already done for image uh, sens sensors by companies like Sony. Uh, but we also want to do it die on a wafer, especially when you have very large dyes, uh, you, 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 you don't want to uh, be penalized by the, by the yield uh, of, of the both wafers, so you need to select the non-good dyes and only put them on, on the places that you want to use. Uh, but the constraint here is that pick and place process is quite slow, so we need to improve the, the, the throughput of the deposition. And so hence the technology that we work on, which is still in research, where you could develop techniques of self-alignment based on, based on hydrophobic, hydrophilic areas uh, combined with pattern before doing your bonding. And then you could improve because you, you would do a very pick and place or almost throw away the, the dyes on the wafers and then self-align them where you need them. Uh, another technology that was briefly mentioned by Giacomo yesterday is the technology that we call Cool Cube, where you grow a second layer of devices on top of the first one. That means that you use the lithography alignment. The constraint is that you have a temperature budget to respect because you don't want your process temperatures of the top layer 
to damage what has been done before. Uh, so it's a big constraint. We are lucky because the most recent technology in the CMOS industry are tending to develop low temperature processes. We work with uh, companies like Applied Materials and others to, to develop uh, processes and equipment that are combining. We be believe that there are many uh, uh, applications for, for these. And one of them uh, will be, I will go through that, uh, exploring uh, how to mimic cortical columns by stacking double layers of memory stores, uh, 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 non-volatile memories combined with uh, uh, processors on top of each other. And that's part of the uh, project that we are uh, trying to, um, the, the project that we are building in, in Europe these days. Um, in terms of conclusion and perspective, I would say that uh, we all already see that people are using 3D structures for GPUs or for deep neural network. Uh, we believe that we need to go further uh, to as you do here in the community, inspire ourselves from biological systems. There we believe that the density of interconnect between functions is very important and 3D will help. Uh, but we need to also be able to combine this with non-volatile memories. This is the aim, for instance, of a ERC a grant that uh, one of our colleagues uh, got recently where we'll try to stack multi-layers of uh, non-volatile memories on top of uh, CMOS layers to explore the interactions between between architecture, design, and technology. So this is a transdisciplinary uh, nature. And I will just finish by saying that we are used to work with the research community here in the US, MIT, Stanford, Caltech, and we are trying to provide more and more prototyping, prototyping and MPW capabilities to help people build uh, new systems. Thank you for your you. attention. Okay, we're, we're approaching break time, but I think we've got time for one or two questions. Ravena. Yeah, th thanks for educating us about all this futuristic uh, technology. Uh, so which uh, foundry are you partnering with? Uh, was, how's this gonna, how's so, this gonna work? <laughs> so um, we, we work both with IDMs like ST Microelectronics and with foundries like Global Foundries and TSM, TSMCs on a general matter. On these topics, for the moment, we are mainly uh, uh, partnering uh, either with fabless companies that are interesting in exploring how these things will impact, or with equipment manufacturers, for instance, EVG in the uh, wafer-to-wafer -wafer bonding, or uh, a small company in France called SCT for the die-to-wafer bonding. Um, cool Cube is a little bit more longer term. Uh, we, we see interest from the, from the community. Other research institutes are now working on it. I, I'm not sure that uh, industrial players have decided to move forward with it because they probably don't need it yet. Uh, the other technologies are, will be available in a matter of uh, probably, some are already available and, 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 and some will be in a matter of two, maybe three years. Okay, one more, I think, uh, over here. Um, on, the, on the grown layers where you can't get up to the uh, temperature for growing oxide, you're going to pay, I believe, a, a frequency performance level on the transistors, and I guess the question is, is how do what what are the what happens to the performance characteristics and the the second, third, fourth layers? Yes. So th this is under evaluation. Uh, I think the the results are diff are different whether you speak of P transistor or N transistor. Uh, I think for the, I'm not sure, I think it's for the P transistors, it's easier. We are close to 98% of performance. And transistor, we are working on it, but we are within 10% today. So depending on the applications, it might be tolerable. And we don't believe that the technology will compete for the highest performance chips for the moment. We see applications in other fields. But that's a very good question, definitely. Yeah, there's, there might be a price to pay in some, in some cases. Okay, thank you very much. There will, of course, be opportunities to ask further questions of the speakers at the open mic session at the end of the afternoon. So.